So for those just joining us and for those who've already been here and I've said it a few times now, we're just going to give a minute or two um, for people to join us. Uh, we are expecting um, probably 80 to 90 people, so I'll just give it another minute for those to come in because otherwise uh, the pop ups will uh, disrupt the PowerPoint. Um, Um, just as a As a heads up to everybody, um, we will be recording this session, so if you're not comfortable having your, your face on the recording, uh, just please keep your camera off. Um, just checking, I seem to have a little technical difficulty, so we're just going to wait a 30 seconds. I do apologize for the lighting. Um, uh, the, the view of the canal is lovely, but the, the sunshine in the afternoon does cause some some issues uh, there. Um, so we will be recording the session. Um, we will be sending it out uh, via email to all those who were able to attend and all those who were unable to attend as well. Um, we'll send the PowerPoint as well. So feel free to take some notes as you go along, but uh, don't worry. By hopefully by the end of this Friday or. Monday or Tuesday next week, we'll be able to send them. So uh, we're going to start, and I do recognize some people will be joining us. So to re repeat, we will be recording this session. So if you're not comfortable with that, please uh, keep your camera off. Um, so my name is Terry Krauk. I am the Administrator of Graduate Studies here at the Faculty of Social Science. Um, I oversee the Graduate Studies Office for this faculty. I am accompanied by many of my employees um, who will be answering questions in the chat uh, as we go along through the, the presentation. Um, so I'll be able to uh, answer some questions uh, at the end, but um, likely if you have questions throughout the process, just write them in the chat and there's uh, about five or six of them that are there to answer questions as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll recap some of the ones in the chat at the end uh, as well, just for those who are just watching the video. So. I oversee the Graduate Studies Office. Um, we take care of the admissions, we take care of external scholarships, and we're just there to uh, support students in the graduate programs. Um, we've invited you guys um, who are predominantly in the fourth years of bachelor's degrees, just in case you're thinking about graduate studies and the next steps. Um, we want to give you an overview of the process of applying, when to start thinking about applying, and all the different places you can access resources in terms of how to apply. Um, so, um, like I said, people will be answering the questions in the chat, um, and um, I'll just start the presentation. So, one second. OK, so um, right now we do admissions in the master's and PhDs. I'm going to focus primarily on the master's programs uh, uh, that we offer. Uh, a lot of the students here are currently in uh, their fourth year of the bachelor's degree, so ideally they're probably thinking about the master's programs. I will briefly touch upon uh, micro programs. So it's a newish uh, graduate studies offer um, that we'll briefly touch upon in, when we go through one of the future slides. And it's a shorter, it's two or three courses, and it's not, it doesn't lead to a degree, um, but it leads to transcript um, mention that you've completed some graduate courses. So um, I'm really going to focus more of the administrative uh, proce process of the admission procedures. Um, and I know in some of the questions that we received in the web form RSVP, there was a lot of questions more specific to the individual programs. We're going to give you the, some guidance on where to get those answers. So those are usually more individualized to the departments um, and we'll give you the contacts to get those answers of 
which option is better for me? What kind of career prospects are there? What kind of research can I do in those fields? We do defer those questions to the departments and we'll give you that information. Right now, we're going to focus on something that's applicable to all the students who, for, who are applying for all our programs and giving more guidelines in terms of the uh, admissions procedures. Um, our dean is very passionate about our graduate studies programs and she's very passionate of our bachelor students and she wanted to make a message for all of you for today. So um, we're going to just start off with a quick uh, short one minute video from our dean just talking about our faculty. Oh, no, that did not work. Sorry guys. I will forewarn you there will be some technical difficulties because there always is when there's presentations, but uh, I do apologize for that one. That was a rookie mistake. Hi, my name is Vicki Barham and I'm the Dean of the Faculty. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Vicki Barham and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Social Science and I want to welcome you very much to the faculty. We're really excited to know that you're thinking of pursuing your studies here at the University of Ottawa. So, I am so proud of the work we do in the faculty. Our graduates have all sorts of wonderful career opportunities after they complete their studies, um, whether it's working for an international organization, whether it's going into the public sector or the private sector. It is amazing what our students are doing. Um, and may, interestingly, uh, this year, the, universe, the um, Ottawa Business Journal published a list of top 40 under 40 here in the Ottawa area. And of the 10 University of Ottawa graduates who were listed, six were from social sciences. And it was fascinating to see that many of our graduates are leaders in the business, in the local business community. So you have many, many options once you graduate from a degree in the social sciences, and you should feel very excited about where studies here might take you in the future. And perfect, and uh, the next slide is- just, Hi, oh, my name. Technology again, sorry. Um, This video doesn't seem to be working, but um, so one of the key things to keep in mind is uh, social sciences, um, as you guys are already in the faculty, you have a good idea of how many programs we have. Um, we have nine different uh, departments within the faculty, and we offer about uh, 12 different uh, streams of masters in terms of uh, fields of study. Um, so we've got anything from anthropology to psychology. We have uh, social work uh, that's only offered in French. Um, we have uh, criminology, economics. We recently added um, uh, the environmental studies as well. We have the Masters of Environmental Studies that falls under our program. And one of the things that we want to discuss with you today is just where to find all this information. I don't know why this PowerPoint keeps switching on me. Um, okay. I'm going to just have to go with that view. Um, so there's there's four main pages that we want to focus on today. Um, so when you're looking at considering our programs, there's four sites. There's the graduate studies site um, that has a lot of the overview, not just for our faculty, but the university. Uh, again, for those wondering, we are sending this PowerPoint later on this week. We are sending this recording to all fourth year students, so you'll get all these links. And I'll go through these four pages more closely in detail because um, it, it really is helpful in terms of being able to navigate and getting all the information that you require to apply. So the graduate studies page at the University of Ottawa has a lot of checklists in terms of things to consider, and it has a lot of funding. So we will discuss some of the funding options for the master's level, but there are some more on their pages, and I'll show you where, of how to find different fundings that would be available to you. Um, the catalog at the University of Ottawa has a list of all the programs, and it gives you an overview. It kind of gives you a snapshot of what are the basic admission requirements and what kind of courses you need to follow and just an overview of the programs. Um, there's also an, another page and this is one of the more important ones is the specific requirements. So the exact documents you need to provide any specific details of what you need to include in those documents, deadlines, 
uh, whether course based master or course based um, research paper or thesis are the options, whether co ops an option, that's all in this page. And then finally, it's the Ontario University's Application Centre where you actually have to do your application. So these four pages will help guide you in terms of preparing your applications. And I'll show you some of the key things that you need to note. Um, so just starting with the University of Ottawa page. Um, sorry. So this is the graduate studies page at the University of Ottawa. So if you just do grad.uottawa.ca or if you type in graduate studies at U Ottawa in Google, again, we'll send you the link. There's two things I really want to point out on this page. So as I mentioned earlier, is if the awards and financial support. So depending on what kind of student you are, whether you're a Canadian permanent resident applying to a master's, uh, if for some reason some of our master's students are here today, there's a section for them, uh, international master's students, you can take a look and see what kind of funding is available to you. Um, so for our master's Canadian students, there's some U Ottawa scholarships and financial support. So these are the admissions scholarships. We have some special merit scholarships and it briefly touches upon teaching assistantships. Those are the main ones that we deal with and we send in our admission offers and I have a slide to explain them briefly later on. Um, there's also some external awards, the province of Ontario, the Canadian government, they have some competitions. Um, we had an information session in early September. If you're thinking of starting your master's next fall, the deadlines for these scholarships are now. They're around December 1st, so we're going to talk to you briefly about those scholarships, but there's a lot of different scholarships. Most of the, these two are handled by us, but these other ones are stuff that you can apply directly to them or it's managed by the university. So there's a lot of different funding opportunities out there for students. Um, and there's some other minor ones as well that are internal to the university, but with affiliated associations. So there's a lot of different financing options that you can explore. The other thing on their page that I really like and I find or a lot of our students find useful is how to apply. So it's a little checklist to go through and help you like on how to decide the programs. It sends you to the catalog link. So all these links that we'll be talking to, you can find them in the step by step um, checklist. And there's some particularities. If you're an international student, you may have a language proficiency requirements. So it explains to you how to look at those. If you're getting some letters of recommendations, there's some guidelines of how to best approach professors, different tips and tricks. So it's a really great resource if you're applying um, for any of our master's programs. So we highly recommend to check out this page and it'll help you uh, just making sure that you set yourself up for success in preparing a successful application. Um, I don't know why it keeps taking me out of presenter view, but it did not do that this morning. Um, the other thing that we want you guys to get familiar with and take a look at just to see the wide array of programs that are available is the catalog at uottawa.ca. So this catalog will list out the programs that are available. And um, so it's a really simple uh, search engine. So you, again, again, if you just Google catalog at uottawa.ca or if you wait for the links, you can filter based on what you're looking for. So I've filtered based on grad studies, master's program in social sciences. But if you're looking for all the faculties, you could just take off a check mark, but we're going to focus on the social sciences. Um, it, it gives you a quick snapshot of what these programs have to offer and whether any of these programs have any specializations. So you might be interested in criminology, but you might also be interested in feminist and gender studies. Criminology has a specialization in feminist and gender studies, so you can apply for this program directly. Um, so we also have the Masters of Science in Environmental Sustainability, which is a new addition for our programs. Um, so take a look at clicking on one of these. You'll get an overview of the programs. This one outlines the differences between the thesis, the major research paper and the courses. Uh, if you click on the admission requirements, it talks as a brief overview about the admission requirement. It doesn't go into details as the specific requirement pages, but it gives you an idea. Um, and it gives you the language requirements. It, it mentions the minimum average um, and some of the courses that they kind of look for. Um, something that students, I saw a lot of the questions in the intake, uh, the RSVP form is 
What kind of courses will I need to take? How long will it take? If you take a look at the program requirements, it breaks it down. So if you're considering an MA with thesis option in criminology, you would have these compulsory courses. You'd have a choice out of one of these two courses, and then you have to take some elective courses. So it breaks down your course uh, that you would take. Um, at the bottom, so it breaks it down whether you're in the MA with major research paper, how many credits you have to complete, uh, the course option, which is brand new as of this fall. Um, we're really excited to have it. Uh, they also have a field placement option in criminology. Um, and if there's any um, relevant uh, notations in terms of the language of instruction, we do have some programs where you, even in the English program, will require, be required to take at least one course in French. Um, political science and public administration has that requirement. Some of the others uh, may have a requirement, but those are the two that stand out to me right now. And it also gives you a brief overview of the duration of the program. So usually a thesis will take about two years to complete. Um, the major research paper can take three semesters, potentially four semesters. Uh, and typically the course option is done through three semesters. So if you're trying to get a better sense of what kind of masters are being available, I highly encourage taking a look at the catalog to get just a, a snapshot of what these programs look like. Um, and then if you want to have a better idea of what these courses are actually are, uh, for each of the masters, there's a tab that gives a brief description uh, of the courses, uh, whether it's a lecture style, a seminar, and the content that I'll be addressed. Um, now, I did mention early on that we also have micro programs. So this is something new. It's something that's been quite popular in Quebec. They call them more micro credits or micro credentials. And it's something the Ontario government has been pushing the last few years. We have introduced over the last two years some micro programs. So they are not degree granting programs. Uh, you will simply, if you complete a micro program and it's about two or three courses at the graduate level, you'll get a notation on a transcript saying you completed a micro program at the graduate level. Um, the advantage with micro programs is if you're not ready for a master's, but you're not done with school yet, is this gives you a leg into the master's. Um, these are stackable, so if a program has two or three, you can maybe you can complete two or three and be almost complete the master's and just have to finish the, the remaining requirements. They would be recognized and the credits would transfer in that instance. Um, so they do they work a bit differently for admissions. You need to just email us and we will tell you which documents you have. One of our more popular ones has been the micro program and evaluation of social and health programs in psychology. So it's simple two courses um, you get a notation on the transcript. Um, you can do it while being admitted into the program or you can do it while not being admitted in the program just as a special student. And it goes through the admission um, requirements for that one. But I'm not going to spend too much time on the micro programs as I'm going to focus more on the masters. But if there's ever any questions, we'll put our contact information um, in, the, in there as well. Um, so that's an, a brief overview of the catalog. And like I said, all our programs are there, all the university's programs are there, and it gives you a good idea of what uh, to expect for those programs. Um, so I think the one that I want to spend the most time on going through is the specific requirements. This is where you get to really see the application deadlines, uh, the available options, whether full-time, part-time, uh, the streams that are available, thesis, the major research paper or course base, um, the minimum requirements and the list of documents to submit your application. I can't stress enough, and my team has told me to repeat it many times, because this is where uh, it is a downfall of many students' applications. Um, it's uh, people not reading the instructions uh, that are available in specific requirements. Some of our programs require a specific template or a specific question to be addressed, and you can find all that information in the specific requirements. So right now we have about 440 applications for our fall 2022. We will get about 2,500 total for the year, and most of them come in from December 1st to about mid-February. Right now, if we notice someone's missing a document, we're able to catch it. But in the next couple of weeks, uh, with the volume that we'll be getting, we won't necessarily be able to catch your, your file if it's incomplete or if it's missing something or you submitted the wrong document. Because you can upload whatever you want. You can upload a picture of a cat for a transcript. 
Right now we're catching it. Later on, it may cause delays in terms of the processing of your files, and then the program may get filled if you if we only catch it later on. So it's important to really read those instructions and to submit the documents in the format uh, and style that is being requested. So take a close look at that. Um, I also want to stress that the minimum requirements are the minimum requirements. It does not guarantee admission. Uh, our programs are quite competitive, um, so if you meet the minimum requirements, you'll be referred to the admission committee, but it does not guarantee uh, that you'll be admitted in the program. It is still a competitive process, um, so it's very important to take note of that. So I'm just going to take a quick look to the specific requirements. Um, so again, you can either Google specific requirements at UOttawa, otherwise we will be sending you to the link. And again, the links can be find, found in that checklist of the first page. We, we discuss, but um, it, it's it's very important to stress the looking at the instructions of the details. I'm going to start off with a PhD one, and I'm going to start with a PhD because I do know a lot of students um, express interest in the MA PhD program in psychology. So it's a combination of a master's and a PhD. You do one year of master's and then you automatically transfer, assuming you're in good standing to the PhD. And it's just a really good example of a department that asks very specific documents in the uh, in the specific requirements. So we can take a look here at the brief overview. They only have a fall intake. They do not have a winter or summer intake. Um, their deadline is December 15th. Now, most of our programs are quite flexible with the deadline. So a lot of them will have a December 1st deadline for international students and a February 1st deadline for Canadians, but they'll still keep uh, the WAC portal available for applications. Psychology, clinical psychology is not one of those. They will close the portal on Dece uh, after December 15th. So if you're interested in clinical psychology, do not wait till December 16th. Make sure to get your application in by the deadline. All the other ones, we still encourage you to apply before the deadline. Um, however, most of them do close a little bit after the deadline, sometimes one month, sometimes six months. It's just they could be closed at any time. So if you are very interested in one of our masters, try to respect the deadline. If if you're past the deadline in all programs, but clinical psychology, they do stay open for a little bit after, but they can close at any point because the deadlines may have been passed. So do take note of the deadlines and take a note if they're available for winter or summer intakes. The majority of our programs are fall intakes. We have very few winter intakes and we no longer have any summer intakes. Um, this will tell you whether or not full-time or part-time is available. So in this case, part-time is not available and whether they have an English and French stream. The majority of our programs are bilingual. Um, social work is only offered in French um, and that's one that stands out, but you can take a look here. Um, Psychology does have a high uh, minimum admission average. They do have an A minus, which is equivalent to an A.0. The majority of our programs are about a B plus, or we have some that are B, so a seven or a six. Um, they always indicate the average time to completion, um, but the most important part right now for those who are considering applying is take a look at what needs to be included in your admission package. So. We'll go through the WAC page, which is the, the, the central agency for all of Ontario that manages uh, admission applications for Ontario universities. You apply through there, but once your application gets sent to us, you'll then have to submit any supporting documents. So you get your supporting documents to us once the, the application gets transferred. And some of them are quite particular. So uh, psychology has a specific template for the letter of intent. Most programs don't have a specific template. Usually it's just word and they tell you exactly what they want in that letter of intent but psychology clinical psychology has a specific template if you don't use their template and it's past the deadline they may reject your file because you have until december 15th to apply but you have until january 8th to submit all your documents and anybody whose files incomplete by that date will be rejected so it's important to get the right documents uh, if you click here it links to more documents because they have a specific template for the cv uh, the majority of the programs do not have a specific template, but clinical psychology does. And they are unique in the sense that they have two additional recommendation letters, and these are, again, a downloadable document. So some of our programs have specific documents, and I can't stress this enough that students do struggle on, on reading this section. 
it's important to take a look um, at uh, the additional documentation that you need to make sure that you're addressing what they're looking for. Some of them, it's just simple, please answer these two questions in the letter of intent. And a lot of times students overlook that and don't answer anything and they're at a disadvantage when they're applying. So I want you to take a look at that. I'm going to show a simpler version because they're not all as complex as, psych as psychology, but I wanted to uh, make a point of the importance to take a look. So just the typical masters, again, it'll show the deadline. Again, no winter or summer intakes. These guys do have a part time option. They have the thesis, major research paper and course space option. Most of our programs have a thesis and major research paper option. Not a lot of ours, or half our programs have a course based option. So if you're looking for a one year degree in course space, you do have to make sure that it's available in the option that you're choosing. It gives you the minimum emission average, which is a seven or a B plus. Um, it tells you the average time of completion for the, the different options. And again here, it talks about transcripts. You need to submit all the transcripts from all the uh, post-secondary uni universities you've attended two recommendation letters and we're going to go into the details on how the calculations works, how the transcripts need to be submitted, how the documents need to be uploaded and how the references uh, need to be uploaded. So we will get to that in a minute. Um, if you're Canadian or permanent resident, the language scores will not be included in your checklist. If you're an international student, it is automatically included. Um, if uh, you have been studying at the University of Ottawa, you are exempt of providing proof. You just need to send us an email and we'll waive the test. Um, so here it's a lot simpler than um, the clinical psychology. It's just a resume, a letter of intent. They do have a specific instruction what they're looking for. Here it's about 250 to 300 words, single space, 12 font. Um, they do not like getting the 12 page letter of intent, but they do get the 12 page letter of intent and we sometimes have to send it back to the students and it causes delays in the treatment of their file. So it's very important that you read these instructions, okay? Um, and that's, that's, that's a basic overview of where to find these information. So take it, take the time to read these pages to make sure you're getting it right. If something's unclear, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're here for the administrative part of the admission procedure. Um, and any questions that aren't being, I, I'm seeing a bunch of chat questions, so I, I'm assuming my team is answering them, but anything that's being left unanswered uh, is probably something that you're, they're just leaving for me to, to answer and I will get to them at the end. Um, so WAC, WAC is the central agency for all of Ontario that manages applications, it does grad or undergrad applications. If you've applied to the University of Ottawa, you probably already used it. Um, key things to note is if you're looking for a French program, you need to change language in the WAC webpage to French. And if you're looking for the English programs, you need to change it to English. It is based on the language that you're visiting the site on. Um, if the term you're interested is not listed on their page when you're looking for a program and you're trying to pick fall 2022, it means the program's closed. We will never close the program before the deadline date for the fall, um, but if it's still, we can close it at any point after the deadline. Um, key thing, and I think I, I said it five times this morning in the French session, um, but I'll say it most likely five times again in this session, is when you're applying through the WAC portal, it'll say, hey, if you've attended Ontario U University, you can pay five or ten dollars. I always forget the price to have us email them the transcript. Please do not pay five or ten dollars to email a U Ottawa transcript to us. Oh, an echo. Um, if everyone can just mute themselves. Uh, perfect. Um, please don't pay five to ten dollars to order a transcript that we already have. So anybody who's attended at U Ottawa University we will take care of your transcripts, so please don't pay the additional order. So when you add uh, the U Ottawa as previous studies and it asks you, do you want to order a U Ottawa transcript? Skip that section. Obviously, if you studied it at U of T and you don't want to contact U of T and you just want them to send us a transcript, then yes, you can pay for the U of T one, but please don't waste your money on a U Ottawa transcript. We will gladly upload it for you. Um, Key thing to note, um, when you apply at WAC, you pay the $110 application fees, it has a few days to transfer to us. Sometimes it takes 24 hours, sometimes it could take seven to 10 business days. You will not be able to access UOZone, the uploading of documents section, 
until it transferred to us. So even if you have access to your Ozone, you won't be able to begin starting um, uploading documents until you get that notification email from you, Ottawa, saying your application has been received. So you pay the $110 application fees and it has a processing delay up to 10 days for the application to transfer to us. And at that point, you'll be able to add your CVs, your resumes and everything like that. So again, if you're thinking about clinical psychology that has a December 15th application deadline and a January 7th or 8th to submit all your documents, don't wait till December 15th to put in your application because if there's a seven to 10 uh, business day delay to get your application transferred to us and it's then going into the holiday period, you're playing with fire. So please take a little bit of a head start on that. Um, and once you get the email from the university saying your application is received and how to go to uh, add your documents, we also send a welcome email that gives you a little step-by-step -step guide of how to upload your documents and how to do your references. Um, one of the frequently asked questions that we get is some of the uh, applications does it have a section for work experience and it is mandatory and some people write to us saying I don't have any work experience what do I do it won't let me skip this section if you don't have any work experience then feel free to put in any volunteer experience again if you don't have any volunteer experience at that point just simply put a not applicable just an NA um, and then you'll be able to move on they do look for the work experience, but it's not a make or break, okay? So just at that point, just put in a not applicable um, so that you can then submit your, your uh, application. So I'll just do a quick overview of the WAC page. Um, I've been logged out. I've been having a locked out issue. Um, it's the joys of uh, technology today. Um, so, WAC is a simple, straightforward, it's a third party site um, that we all Ontario universities deal with. You go in, you create an account. If you applied for your undergrad, you can use the same um, access as before. Um, you click on the select programs. It's not, well, that's going to work. And it's just basically some drop down questions and stuff. Um, for those who may have questions with their hands raised, I'll, I'll address the questions at the end. Um, if you have questions throughout the process, just put them in the chat and I'll, I'll get to the questions at the end um, and uh, we'll go through those uh, when we can. Uh, but my team is here to answer any questions in the chat. So for the WAC, you just go through and it's a lot of simple drop down questions and it's more of demographic details and stuff. And then after once your application gets transferred, that's when we get into the nitty gritty with the CVs, the transcripts, the letter of intents. Um, and the recommendation letters, and that's where you complete your file. So WAC is pretty user friendly um, and it's pretty straightforward, but if there's any questions around the, the application procedures, we've got our contact info at the end and we can assist you with that. Um, I did see one question and I do want to touch upon it at this point. Um, how competitive are our programs? So we, we do get 2,500 applications. Um, so, so we do have a lot of interest in our programs. Some of our programs do admit a lot. Um, I think public and international affairs can do a close to 160, 170 offers. Um, we do have do a lot of offers. We've done about 900, 950 app, uh, admission offers the last two years um, on about 24, 2500 uh, applications. Some programs are a lot more competitive than others. Uh, psychology will have about 200, 250 applications, sometimes 300. Uh, clinical psychology admits 50 people and that's on 200, 250 applications. So um, some programs are extremely competitive. So it depends on which program you're applying for. Um, and it, 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 it varies from year to year. Um, one thing that we've noticed is that averages have gone up um, the last few years, um, especially since COVID. Um, SNS grades um, that have been instituted at many Canadian inter, inter, Canadian universities have inflated grades. So in the past, when we've admitted people with 7.2s or 7.3s, 7.4s, last year we did see a, a, a general increase in terms of the admission average of the students um, that that were admitted. So. These are the four main pages. So again, grad.uottawa.ca has a great checklist and some other financing. The catalog will give you a good snapshot of what the program entails. The specific requirements gives you the nitty of things to consider um, and what you need to submit 
And then when you go through WAC, that's how um, you apply for our, our graduate programs. Um, so I just want to want to just keep going in the presentation and I, I just keep putting your questions in the chat and the team's going to answer them and we'll get to the rest of them at the presentation. Um, so once you've applied through WAC and the five to 10 business days, sometimes it's quicker, uh, you'll get an email saying you can now go into UOZone and upload your documents. So you cl click on applications, uh, you'll see which application that you applied for and you can start uploading your mission documents. Again, your U Ottawa transcript will take care of it, but if you've done any exchanges or if you studied at other Ontario universities, you can upload your documents yourselves. You have to upload your documents yourselves. And at this point, at the application process, they can be unofficial transcripts. If you're admitted, we will then potentially request some official uh, transcripts that will be noted in your admission offer. So you'll have to make sure that you look at the specific requirements and you upload in the right format, the CV, the letter of intent, and there's another feature for the reference letters. Um, so it's all in UO zones. It's relatively straightforward. Um, the key things to note is just pay attention to the details. Uh, transcripts, um, they ask you to merge them by institution. So sometimes students will try to upload page by page, uh, one page at a time, a U of T transcript, but we only get the first page. So it's important to merge your PDFs into one by institution. So make sure to pay just attention to the little details because eventually we'll see you had a U of T transcript, but when we click on it, we've got page one of eight. So it's making sure that you merge your documents and upload it properly by following the instructions. And it's really, really user friendly, this tool. Um, when it comes to references, I saw a lot of questions in the RSVP form. Uh, does do I need to contact people and they email it to you? The, do they need to mail it to you with a signed envelope? Everything is finally digital for these recommendation letters, uh, the generic uh, academic recommendation letters. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on this point because I know there was a lot of questions. So you go into uh, the admission file. There's a section to select your program. You click on it, you add the names and you add the email address. Make sure that you put in the right email address. Um, typos at that point can cause some delays. Um, we highly encourage you to contact your referees in the first place to make sure that they're willing to submit a reference letter for you. Um, we've had a lot of questions like how much importance does reference letters plays? It really depends on program by program. So uh, in an extremely competitive program like clinical psychology, it does play a role. In some of the programs that might not get as many admission requirements, it can play a role, but it can also be something that sometimes they, they ask to see the the applications with just one of the two uh, reference letters submitted. So they have a little bit more leeway in those programs. Um, I do also see it when they're on the fence, when it's students closer to the admission cutoff of that year, uh, the, the uh, reference letters can play a role in there. Um, so we highly encourage you to reach out to professors. We had a lot of questions about how do I find a reference in the COVID era when I've never really had the chance to meet with the professors. Professors are cognizant of the challenge, challenges of um, COVID. So if you did extremely well in their course, they'll be able to comment on your academic success on that stuff. So even if they might not know you personally, they are uh, aware and understanding that we are going through a, a unique period in time. So, uh, but if you've had profs where you've had office hours, even virtually and stuff, and you've had a more personal connection and they can have a better assessment, obviously those are always, uh, strongly recommended, but um, during these difficult times, people are understanding and are empathetic to that. So it's something to keep in mind for that. So again, these are very important. One thing that we, we do often notice, sometimes we'll have people who apply for Masters in Arts in Public Administration, and they'll submit a second application for Masters in Art Public Administration with a specialization in Feminist and Gender Studies. You need to upload the documents for each application. They, they don't automatically transfer, so you ought, upload two CVs, you upload two letter of intents. Um, sometimes if it's an MA in public administration and an MA in economics, sometimes some students use different reference letters. So you need to up, use the referees twice. So they need to fill out two letters um, in some. So it's very important to not just assume that they will transfer from one application to another. You need to upload those documents twice. Um, now we get to the fun part. Uh, no, not yet. Next slide. 
things to know. So again, I told you and forewarned you that I'll repeat this five times. Please do not pay to have your UAuto transcript uploaded by WAC. Um, save yourself the five, ten dollars. Donate it to some charity. Don't waste the money for WAC. We will gladly upload your UAuto transcript. It's easier for us to read the transcripts that we provide versus the one that they provide. So just save yourself the hassle and the money. Um, again, just having the minimum requirements does not guarantee admissions. Some of our programs have gotten extremely competitive and we do have a lot of applications. Um, it, it varies from year to year, the cutoff um, that we end up going. And sometimes they, they will admit someone with a lower average based on some strong reference letters, but um, it, it varies. So it does not guarantee just meeting the minimum requirements that you'll be admitted. Um, and again, if you're an international student and you've been asked for a language test, you may be exempt. So uh, write to us, if, especially if you've been studying at the University of Ottawa, you will be exempt. So just send us an email and we'll gladly fix that. So one of the things that we get a lot of questions in the RSVP, so we tried to do a visual aid for this, is calculations. I, I give some basic point forms. Um, key things is all other institutions get converted to the U Ottawa grade scale. For U Ottawa students, it's quite simple to get a good idea of where your mission, record, mission average will be. We look for the masters at the most recent 60 credits alphanumeric grades. So we exclude any S and S grades. So we just start in your most recent semester. So even if you're applying for fall 2022, if you apply right now, we're going to take the grades that you submit at this point. We're not going to wait for your fall and winter grades. We're going to start now. And even once we calculate the average, we are not going to recalculate later. So if we feel like you merit an admission scholarship and that you, your average between now and then, we're not going to go back and say, oh, we're taking it back. What we calculate now will stick with your admission file. So we look at the 60 most recent credits, um, alphanumeric grades. Um, anything that's been a repeated course, we take the most recent grade. So if in your most recent 60 credits, you've got an F, you might want to repeat that course and maybe wait to apply for the winter. And then we can try to recalculate your average with that new grade because an F can pull down your, your average. Um, this is a very new rule uh, as of uh, yesterday. Language courses are excluded. So any second language courses that you're taking during your program, they are not counted in the average. Uh, in the past, they were counted if it was to your advantage, but they are now currently excluded. So any ESL or FLS courses, they are excluded from the admission averages. And exchanges are included. In the past, it was if it was to your advantage, but we've just had a major uh, grade scale reform. And so exchanges are included into your admission averages. Keep in mind, a lot of students, uh, we, we use um, um, interchangeable terms sometimes. We usually say it's the 20 most recent courses when we're talking about admission averages. However, if you have a six credit courses, it could be your, your 19 most recent courses. So it's really the last 60 credits that we focus on. And I'm just gonna go to the U Ottawa grade scale. So basically your A plus is worth a 10, your A is worth a nine and A minus is an eight. So we take your last 60 credits and we come up with a grade point average that in psychology, you need an 8.0 to be uh, referred to the admission committee. So you need to have your last 60 credits equal an 8.0. Most of our programs are B pluses. So we're looking at a 7.0 and some of them are a B. I'll show you the tool that we use. So this is just, a. I took a really basic examples. Um, I saw that chat question, and that's why I try not to answer the chat because I get easily distracted. Language courses that are part of a program do get counted. It's just the second language courses like the ESL and the FLS courses that do get excluded. So if part of your program you took a Spanish course or if you took a Ukrainian course or Russian courses, they will be counted. It's just any of the FLS and ESL courses that will be excluded. Um, so I took a very basic sample. So four semesters, five courses each semester. Um, and it's just looking at the last 60 credits. So again, an A is worth a nine. Um, an A minus is an eight, a B plus is a seven. What you'll see is, yes, this person's got a lot of nine, eights and tens. It's just when you get an F in there, it will really drag down the average um, or if there's a C. So it's really looking at the big pictures. Now, a lot of 
times we have a question when it follows a summer courses. So let's say in summer 2020, they followed two courses. When we get to September 2019, we would only have had to cho choose three of these five courses. And people always wonder, how do I know which ones that you're going to choose? Because we always take the one that's to the advantage to the, of the students. So if you took two courses in summer 2020 and we it all, we only need to take nine credits for September 2019, we're gonna we're gonna take the A, the A minus, and the B plus. So you save yourself two B pluses. Um, so <coughs> that's how we work for the average. We take the most recent 60 credits, and if we get to a semester where we there's we need less courses than are available, we take the ones that advantage the students. Um, so. That's a basic overview of the average, um, and it, it's not something that we will not do pre-calculations for students. Um, we only do calculations for those who, who have applied. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we get about 2,500 applications. If we did pre-calculations for everyone, um, we would never be able to complete our admission processes. So we unfortunately cannot do pre-calculations. For you, Ottawa students, it's relatively straightforward to get an idea of your average. You just convert your A's. If they're all three credit courses, you just take the last 60 credits and just do some basic math. Um, and it'll give you an idea um, where it gets. So an average calculation for us can take up to five minutes for you Ottawa transcripts. But when we get to our international ones or even some of the Canadian ones, it can take up to 15 to 20 minutes. So that's why we unfortunately cannot do pre-calculations. We'll only do average calculations um, for those who have applied. So the other thing to, to keep in mind, and I, I know this always generates questions for calculations, so if they're not answered in the chat, I will get to them um, in the next uh, at the Q&A at the end. Um, the, the thing that keeps changing the last few years has been the admissions scholarships. So I'm going to start with the simplest one. Those who have a 9.0 to 10 average, admission average. So once we calculate your admission average, if you have a 9.0 to 10.0, um, we have an unlimited number of master's scholarships. Um, they do vary a bit between the course and MRPs, the major research paper and the thesis, but it's just a slight variation. So anybody with a 9.0 to 10.0, they will automatically get a $7,500 admission scholarship for the first year. So it's breaking down into $2,500 per semester, and they will get uh, two TAs throughout the duration of their program. So it's two teaching assistantships that you will have to apply for, but they were reserved for our scholarship students um, who get it in their admission offers. So if you are 9.0 to 10.0, and in your admission offer, you get the admission scholarship, you get $7,500 in your first year, and you get two TAs during the duration of the program. So usually the course-based ones will get one in the fall, one in the winter, and the major research paper ones will get one in their first year, one in their second years. Now, again, if you're in the thesis option with a 9.0 to 10.0, again, you get $7,500 scholarship in the first year, and you'll get two TAs per year for two years because the program is two years. So you get uh, two teaching assistantships in the first year, two teaching assistantships in the second year, Again, you need to apply for them, but they are you are guaranteed a TA. So as long as you apply, you will get them. Where it is a bit uh, more tricky is the merit scholarships. So the 8.0s to 8.9s, we have a limited number of scholarships with strict response dates. So they're not guaranteed that they'll be included in your admission offers, but we do have a fair amount of them. And last year we were able to give them to the majority of our 8.0s to 8.9 students. Um, I think we gave them to 97% of our students. Um, it always depends on how many students we admit uh, and depending on when you apply. Uh, last year, I think after March 15th, we didn't have any left. Um, but uh, if you're admitted, if the if you apply and you're admitted before that date, we're hoping to still give close to that same amount, but it really depends on how many uh, students we have with the 8.0s to 8.9 averages. What we've noticed with the SNS grades the last two years is the averages have gone up, so we do have a lot more people that are eligible. So that's why we do have a limited number of scholarships with strict response dates. So what what is in every package that of those who get this offer for the merit scholarship, they automatically get a $7,500 for those who get this uh, offer, and it's broken down $2,500 per semester. 
and some of them will get a TA's uh, teaching assistantships matched with that. So again, the course and major research paper will get two TAs for the duration of the programs and the merit scholarship thesis students will get three TAs over the duration of the program. These are going to be at the department's discretion and it will be identified in your admission offer whether or not you're a recipient of the TA component of the merit scholarship. Um, we're hoping that all our 8.0s to 8.9s will get this, but it is a limited number amount of scholarships with a strict response date. So um, we will, usually it's a three week response date. So if someone is not willing to make a decision at that point, we then go to the next uh, eligible student and we do a revised offer. So this is something that's been changing. A lot of Ontario universities have been revising their master's uh, funding uh, and we've done changes the last two years. So it has caused some confusion. Uh, we do our best to try to answer them, um, but the key thing is it will be included in your mission offer if you're eligible or uh, if you are a recipient of these scholarships. The other thing that I briefly touched upon earlier was the external scholarships. Uh, we wanted to do this open house information session early on now because there are two deadlines that are coming up end of uh, early December on December 1st. The Ontario Graduate Scholarships and the Canada Graduate Scholarships. So it's anybody who's planning on doing their masters as of fall 2022 or winter 2023. You can apply for these Ontario Graduate Scholarships and CGSM, the Canada Graduate Scholarships, now for next year. So the December 1st deadline is for people planning on starting next year. Even if you're not admitted, even if you haven't applied, if you plan on applying and being admitted at the University of Ottawa, you need to apply for these programs now. They do take a lot of time because they are uh, quite a quite cumbersome in terms of the documents that are required. But the, the Canada Graduate Scholarship Master's one is about 17,500. And we usually get about 40 to 50 of these uh, at the master's level. And the Ontario Graduate Scholarships, we get about 70 to 80 people uh, eligible for that. Um, we get about 250 applications for this, and we usually give out 70 to 80 scholarships. And this is $15,000. So they're, they're really interesting scholarships. Um, we've recently sent out, you should have all received the, the presentation we did in September. If you're interested and you want, haven't received it, send us an email at scsgrad at uottawa.ca. We'll have the email address in, a, in one of the next slides. Um, key things to note, and I said it during the part of the presentation on in September, they do have different rules for the admission averages. They look at the last two years as separate entities and both of those last two years need to be above 8.0. So you can't just have an 8.5 and a 7.5. Both of those last two years need to be above 8.0. Otherwise, your files will be ineligible for those scholarships. So if you have worries about your average, please check with us. For this one, we can assist you. Um, but take a look at these applications. Um, they're really interesting scholarships, and uh, they're really good to have. Um, for our international students uh, in our francophone programs, so um, the uh, tuition differential, um, instead of being charged international tuition fees, you get charged international tuition fees and you get automatically credited a scholarship that covers the majority of the difference between Canadian fees and international fees. To be eligible for the tuition differential, you need to be either in a program that's only offered in French. And in our faculty, the only program that's only available in French and not in English is uh, the master's in social work. So if you're admitted in that program, you would be an, and you're an international student, you're eligible for the differential tuition fee. Otherwise, if you apply for one of our French programs and you've got two years of previous studies completely in French, so either two years of high school, two years of uh, previous university degree uh, or two years, here, you would be then potentially eligible for the tuition differential. So there, it is slightly different than the undergrad rules. And if you're unsure, feel free to check with us if you're eligible. Um, so the key things, and I know in the RSVP, there was a lot of questions about like, what kind of job can I get with this master's or which option is best for me, course base, uh, MRP. Those questions are more for the department. Um, and we'll give you their contact information in the next slide. Our office deals with more of the administrative procedures and the technical difficulties of the admission process. What documents do I need to submit? What are the deadlines? I'm having issues applying. You reach out to us. 
Um, we're back in person and we love seeing people in person. I know it's not everyone's comfort levels, so we're really accessible. A lot of students will do a Teams call with us, uh, email. We're pretty quick with our email addresses. I know there's a lot of places on campus that have struggled staying on top of their email addresses. My team has been phenomenal at answering emails, so don't hesitate to email us at asgrad at uottawa.ca. You can visit us at FSS 3021. Um, there's also a web form if you want to schedule an appointment, if uh, you just don't want to send us an email, or if you have more precise questions, it, it'd be our pleasure to meet with you. Um, I, I, this session, I see a lot of like icons and stuff. I just miss having that human contact and just even a phone call is sometimes nice. And we're there to help you and we're there to assist you. We're there to make this process as simple as possible. Because I know it is a big jump going from a bachelor's to master's and you might have a lot of questions and that's what we're here to help you with. Um, what we're not uh, able to help you with is specific questions to like what kind of careers and stuff. And there's a great team in the departments that are there to help you. And I know these emails are going to fly by really fast and stuff. And we will be sending this presentation um, with all these email addresses. But if you write to the departments, they're there to tell you exactly, OK, well, this is the kind of degree. And stuff. it's either the departments that are going to answer or they're going to get the program uh, coordinators. They, they have a specific professor that's assigned to the MA, the PhD, and they're there to answer you. The departments will try to answer as many questions. But don't hesitate to ask those questions. Make sure you find out what you're getting into and making sure you're asking the right questions. Um, they're they're eager to answer your questions and they're there more for the 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 nitty gritty of their programs of like what it entails, what kind of studies, what kind of courses. Um, we 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 don't have the details that they have. What we have is the simple processes of the admission procedures. But if you're looking for the more holistic view of the programs, you, you need to reach out to the departments and they'd be more than happy to help you out with that kind of stuff. Um, the key thing is just to ask questions. We're accessible. I know uh, COVID has made things impersonal, but we really want to have the more personalized approach. We used to do these sessions foyer of S FSS and it used to be a really lively discussion. I really miss having that personal connect connection with you guys. So just don't hesitate. We're here. We're, we're not hiding behind computer screens. We're, we'll, we'll reach out to you in the way that you want to be reached out, whether it's in person or virtual chat or even emails. Just don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, so that's the presentation in a nutshell. Um, sorry for the few technical glitches. It did not do the same things as before. Um, I, if you want to ask some questions live, I'll start with those and then I'll hop into the chat and uh, answer questions as they uh, see if there's any questions that are, haven't been answered. So I think Grace, you were the first one to uh, raise your hand and then I've got Alice and Natalie uh, going in that order. Grace, did you uh, still have a question? Okay, well, we'll circle back to Grace and maybe Alice, uh, if you had a question. Yes, um, so I'm so, there's an echo, sorry. Um, I'm currently in my last semester of my of my um, program, my bachelor program, and I was wondering um, because I the pro the masters that I want to apply to, it's um, I require two econ classes, so I'm gonna I'm planning on taking those in the next semester, so the summer spring semester and um, I was wondering if I would still be able to apply for my um, master's even though like I'm not I, I don't have these two econ classes yet but I will have them by the time my master's start yeah for sure so a lot of times um, I assume you're registered for those courses so a lot of times they'll take a look at what you're registered because your transcripts will in which courses you're registered and haven't completed to. So if they see that you're registered to that, they'll take that as a positive sign. Sometimes they might hold off. Uh, economics is one of the programs. They don't start sending admission offers so early February, uh, unless in extreme exceptional circumstances. But they 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 go into well into July in terms of their admission offers. So uh, sometimes if they see your other courses, they'll they'll extrapolate that you're going to succeed in those courses as long as they see that they're registered. Other cases, they sometimes will put them as conditions to your admission. So they'll say you'll need to pass these courses to be admitted. 
um, but it, 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 nothing stops you from applying at this point for that for that well, specific. The thing is, my program, it's, I'm not in econ, I'm in uh, political science and the program, the master's I'm looking for is public and international affairs. Um, so the, like, I just didn't take um, micro and macroeconomics when I was like during my um, bachelor's. So um, yeah. that's what I'm taking in the spring, summer, and then I'm planning on applying for my master's in the fall. So the new school semester. Um, yeah. And Public and international affairs is another one. They they usually they for that course in particular they they do either put it as a pre uh, as an additional requirement or different things like that. But there's nothing uh, stopping uh, stopping from applying. And um, okay, one last question. <laughs> um, no worries. So I took my bachelor in French immersion and got my you know my one thousand dollars scholarship for for French immersion. Um, is there an equ equivalent for that in graduate school or is it just the scholarships that you mentioned. It, there's no French immersion scholarships uh, at the graduate level. It's just the ones that I mentioned. There, plus some of the external ones of the cabinet, but there's not one for French immersion, unfortunately. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> no worries. Uh, feel free to add more questions in the chat as we go along. The, the rest of the team is still going to answer them. Um, so I had uh, Natalie next on my list. Yeah, so my question just is, um, you said that FLS grades were excluded um, from those kind of 20 class uh, what they look at but does that still apply if you're doing like an official minor in French as a second language? Um, that's a very good question so basically we just got the instructions yesterday so we're still uh, learning what the interpretations are because um, they told us any courses that have an FLS course code or an ESL code um, so if it's courses that fall outside of that, uh, it's, it, it would still be considered in the average. But if it's an ESL course, FLS, we were told it was uh, excluded. If it's part of a minor, we're going to have to just get a clarification from the, the uh, Cabinet of Graduate Studies uh, and a ruling from their part just to be consistent with other faculties. But my understanding is they okay. would be excluded, but I'll, I'll, val I'll validate that. Um, and uh, okay. if someone... Feel free to email us at SCS grad and we'll get back to you with a, an answer on that one. OK, thank you. Per perfect. And Victoria. Hi, um, my question is about the public and international affairs program. Um, you mentioned briefly about like how many students are admitted in the English section, but I, I forgot what you said. Um, so it, I, I didn't specify the language for the public and international affairs. They admit about 170 every year and their final numbers are usually around 90, but I don't know the breakdown by the department. I don't have that uh, handily accessible, but uh, the best bet for that specific kind of question would be to, to reach out to the department. They they give you, a, they're, they're the one who established mission quotas each year. Uh, they sometimes share it with me. They sometimes don't. Sometimes it's a surprise to me. Um, we really just we, we really deal with the more administrative part um, and I just couldn't have nine units answering nine questions. It, it, it would have been uh, it would have been fun, but it would have been uh, uh, it wouldn't be necessarily applicable for everyone. But th that type of question, you could uh, definitely follow up with the department. They'll give you a better context of the breakdown by department uh, by by language. Um, also, I was wondering for the part about second language requirements. Um, when you write in there, like, how do you like, um, like, how do you demonstrate that in your letter of intent? So the, the second language requirements are um, only um, typically for our international students, and it's usually a language test. So for uh, students who are applying for the English programs, they'll get a, a they'll need to do a, either a TOEFL or an IELTS, their uh, internationally accredited language test. Um, there are some programs like public administration and political science where you need to complete one course in the, in French. Um, and usually it's trying to show your background. Sometimes they'll do a phone call with you. Sometimes they'll try, do a one-on-one -on -one chat to see your level of French. Um, in those instances, they don't necessarily require a language test. But if you've taken uh, courses here at the University of French, you can outline that in a letter of intent. But usually the, the language requirements are usually required for our international students. Um, who hasn't studied at a Canadian or uh, institution in English 
uh, for at least two years. Oh, so like those courses, like I think public and international affairs, you need to take one course in French. So for that, they'll like give you a phone call or maybe just demonstrate that you took FLS courses if they, and if they have questions of whether or not you have any backgrounds so like if there's no indication of any courses usually they'll see it on your transcript but if you want to highlight your letter of intent that's even better uh, if you've taken fls courses or esl courses that will encourage them um, if there's no indications they may follow up i have not heard of public and international affairs doing one-on-one -on -one chats but i have heard about it in public administration and uh, political science perfect thank you no problem. Um, I believe Sarah was next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I just have uh, two quick questions for you about um, the master's in criminology. I was wondering, yeah. the deadline says January 15th. Does that mean that all applications are being reviewed after January 15th and offers are coming out after that deadline? Or are applications being reviewed as we speak and offers are going out right now? Um, that is a long-winded answer to that that's applicable to all programs. Um, there's no real offers going out right now. We are debating starting to send out the 9.0s, um, masters and any of our PhD offers to the committees in the upcoming weeks. One of the issues right now is the, the component that I was talking about in the merit scholarship, um, with the 8.0s to 8.9s, there's a $7,500 scholarship and there may be uh, teaching assistantships attributed. Uh, the budgets haven't been set out yet for the department, so we're not in the process yet of sending any admission offers for the 8.0s to 8.9s. Typically, most departments will start looking probably closer to early February. Uh, the advantage of applying now is if you need more additional help or it, it, it's easier for us to catch if there's a mistake in an application now because we've got about 400 applications compared to around December when we start getting about 100 applications per day popping in um, or close to 200, 300 applications per week later on in January. So it, we're, we're able to catch things if you start it sooner. Criminology is one of the departments that are pretty quick at starting to send out offers they will start around mid-january but it differs from year to year like um, last year they were able to start sending offers in mid-january and they took a lead but not all the departments start uh, economics has already let us know that they will send out a few offers between february 1st for um, extremely high averages but the majority will start on february 1st um, and psychology, I think, starts around mid-February, clinical psychology. Uh, some of the others will wait a little bit um, elsewhere, uh, a little bit later. And some of the programs will go well into uh, June, July, but some of them, um, they're done in March and they'll, they'll close all the files. Um, so it, it varies um, in, it varies from year to year, it's, uh, it's to gauge, but. Um, it, it's important to get your applications in on time. Uh, the majority of the programs will still admit afterwards, but you, you're running a chance once you start getting past those deadlines. And the key things is a lot of people will apply and then just they'll take weeks or months to submit the documents or they'll submit the wrong documents. So it's really, really important to read the specific requirements and making sure that you're paying attention to the details of Clinical psychology, I know a lot of you guys wrote interest in clinical psychology. It's an extremely competitive program, so they don't have sympathy if you, you don't read the instructions. So it's important to make sure you're using the right templates that are listed in the specific requirements. Um, most programs won't, I think almost all programs don't outline the, the, the way the files are evaluated, but clinical psychology, I'll share my screen one last time. Uh, clinical psychology will actually give you a ranking grade. You can see it off the specific requirements. It's in one of the additional documents link, and they show down the breakdown of what you're looking for. Now, this clinical psychology is the only one that does this. I don't know of any other department that does this, but it gives you a breakdown of what to look for. But that's a long-winded answer to your question. So they, they might start in early January, uh, Sarah. Um, but not necessarily, uh, not necessarily before then, I don't think. Okay, thank uh, you for 
I that was perfect. you said you had a second question I believe I do, or, yes or? I can't recall yeah. if this is already covered by you but I was wondering if the university needs a total of 60 credits to calculate your admission scholarship um, and they need one more class and one more grade do they go into the next semester and take the highest grade in that semester or that do they just correct. whatever is there okay so the highest okay. Read will be the highest achieved grade will be used. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering. We're, we're trying to give the advantage to the students. We're not trying to be like, oh, we're going to take this one because it's, it's. Yeah, like, I wasn't sure if you take like the most recent one that appears on the transcript or if you would take whatever is the highest. Um, but thank you. No, because uh, some schools go alphabetical, some schools like. They, we assume they got all completed at the same time, so we just take the highest of that semester. So, sorry, I have one more question. I'm sorry to make you repeat this, but no you worries. mentioned um, something. You mentioned that when we're on UAC and we're applying, not to pay for the transcript to be sent to the university, but you also mentioned um, sending an unofficial transcript or including an unofficial transcript. Does that mean that we're not supposed to pay? You act to send our um, transcript, but we upload an unofficial transcript. No. So, what? Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, yeah. For WAC, I don't want you to order a U Ottawa transcript. We will personally upload your U Ottawa transcript. If you attended U of T for like a year, or if you did Queens, any Ontario universities, you can also choose to order those. I think it's five or ten bucks per transcript. Just don't pay for the U Ottawa one. It's a waste of money. Um, now, if you don't want to pay for the U of T transcript and you have an unofficial U of T transcript, you can upload it yourself as well. So don't waste your money on the U of T transcript if you've attended any of the other Ontario universities. If you've attended uh, McGill or something else before U Ottawa, then you could upload a, U a McGill transcript because you can't order any institutions outside of Ontario. So. The unofficial transcripts are fine at the application process for any institutions other than U Ottawa because you don't need to worry about U Ottawa. We will upload it for you. Um, but if you attended a U of T and you don't want to talk to U of T because they're not as good as us, um, you can pay the five bucks to order it so you don't ever have to speak to U of T. Um, but that off that option at WAC is still available for other Ontario universities you may have attended. Otherwise, you can upload transcripts from those universities and we accept unofficial transcripts at the application process in UO docs and not waste the money. But you Ottawa transcripts, don't worry about them. OK, thank you so much for clarifying that. No problem. Um, I've got Cheetah. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name properly. Sorry. Hi, yeah, you pronounced it properly. Thank you. Perfect. Um, I just had a few questions about the micro programs. I was wondering if we would be able to take some of those courses during our undergrad. Uh, it's a case by case. Um, some some departments permit it, some departments don't. Some of the micro programs will permit it, some of them don't. Um, I know it's a very wishy washy answer. Um, it's it's managed by uh, six or seven different committees the psychology ones will likely not permit you because um, it's mostly PhD students some of the other ones may um, send us an email if there's one that interests you and we'll check with the admission committee because the other thing is if the the micro program admission committee is interested you then have to go back to your the undergrad office to see if they'll let you um, so it's a bit complicated to do it at the undergrad level um, okay. I know arts has one in psychedelics um, that they've given some permission to some undergrad students, um, but we have yet to do that in any of ours, um, and it would have to be assessed on a case by case basis. I, I know that's not a very clear answer, um, but uh, that's the best answer I can give at this point. Okay. I was also, um, I guess I was specifically wondering about the, I think it was data analysis um, micro program. Yeah, so that one's in sociology. Um, I'm unclear if they'll they'll do it. So, um, uh, feel free to send us an email. Um, we'll reach out to them, see if there's a possibility. Because if there's no possibility, there's no the, there's no reason to ask the undergrad office. And if they they're open, then we would then have to explore the possibility with the undergrad office. Okay. Great. It's a it's a two course program, so it's a really interesting program. But 
uh, they might want to limit the, the access to it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. No problem. And uh, Agatha, I believe you're next. Hi, yeah, um, I think there was kind of a similar question in the chat, but I'm not sure if it got answered or not. Um, oh, but okay. basically, I'm a co-op student. That means that I graduate at the end of the fall 2022 semester and would be looking to apply to master's programs for fall 2023. So okay. because I graduate kind of in a different time, would that kind of affect um, if I'm able to access documents like on UO Zone and like if I'm able to apply through U Ottawa, basically. If you're applying for fall 2023, um, I, I suggest to hold off just a little bit in terms of trying to get your transcripts a bit more complete. Um, depending yeah, on which. No, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean like applying now. I just mean like if I was applying in fall 2022, would I be able to access my my stuff in the winter? if I've already graduated by the winter time? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, either way, I think once uh, your application submitted, your your UO zone would be reactivated, but I don't think it shuts down automatically. Um, I'm not 100% sure when they deactivate your UO zone, but I think you should still be able to access it after uh, graduation. Um, key things to note though, if you're, completing in the fall 2022, depending on which program, there are some programs that do winter intakes, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, political science, sociology, uh, anthropology, economics. Those are the ones that come to mind right off the bat. But some of our other programs, especially uh, uh, international development, public and international affairs, criminology, they don't do winter intakes. So um, mm -hmm. there is a possibility for winter intake, but you should be able to have no issues accessing the UO zone uh, for the documents at that point. Otherwise, once you apply and it gets transferred to us, it would get reinitialized. But I, I, I'm i assuming it doesn't get shut down. Um, but as soon as you apply, you would, your access would be re-granted. So it would be, if anything, a few days delay, so. All right, thank you so much. No problem. Um, oh, they never shut down your UO zone. Yeah, good to know. Um, is there any other live questions out there? Um, I'm gonna, yes, Haley, and then I'm going to ask my team to maybe speak up if there's any questions in the chat, because I see there's a hundred questions in the chat, if there's any that haven't been answered. So I've got a Haley and a Brenna. So Haley, your question. So I'm just wondering, because I took, um, like I did like summer school uh, at a different university just because U Ottawa wasn't offering the courses at that time. So on my transcript, it says like credit received, but there's no grade. Would those classes, the grade I got in those be used um, to calculate like my grade point average or would we just like, do? would it be skipped over and like use like the five other ones from a different semester? Um, so you would need to uh, get the transcripts from that course. So um, if you've already submitted to U Ottawa and you can't seem to get it from the other university, speak to us. We'll see what we can do. Um, but we need transcripts from all university studies done. So if you've done an exchange in uh, University of Vienna, um, we'll take care of the U Ottawa transcript. But if the U Ottawa transcripts say exchange semester or letter of permission or transfer credits, uh, you will then need to upload an unofficial copy of that transcript. So if it, especially if it falls in the last 60 credits, but even if it falls before that, we need to have uh, copies of all your university studies. And so if that course is in your most recent 60 credits, then yes, we will include it in the average um, and we'll take a look, it will, it will count. Okay, perfect. I was just wondering if you guys like used that to calculate or if you just looked at it and saw that it was there, but yeah. And so what we do is uh, if it's apples to oranges, so if it's something at Carleton where it's 0 0.5 credits uh, and it's a different grade scale, they get converted to the U Ottawa grade scale. And obviously a 0 0.5 credit course there is equivalent to our three credit course. So we weigh it as a three credit course. So we're not going to take six 0 0.5 credits to the U Ottawa, uh, Carleton to count it as a three credit course. It's the equivalent of the course credit. So because um, every institution has different crediting systems and different grade scales, everything gets converted. So if you went to Vienna and they have 120 credit courses, 
we find the equivalent in our three credit system and we have grade scales for every institution almost in the world. Um, it's quite a system. So, um, I, uh, who was next? Uh, Haley, did, did you have another question or? No, that was everything. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, Brenna and then uh, my team has pointed out a chat question that is for me. So uh, Brenna. Hi, yes. Um, so with the grades of or the classes, the grades from the class I've um, completed so far, I'm not quite uh, like eligible for like for a master's or my grades are just not quite high enough. So I'm relying on like my uh, fall and winter courses from this year, my fourth year to um, like get into a master's. Does that mean that I would have to apply for fall 2023 if I wanted like my fall and winter semester grades to be included? Not necessarily. So depending on which program you apply for. So if you were applied today and um, if you if your assessment is correct that you don't meet the minimum admission average, um, we will likely deny you at this point. If you write back to me and say, hey, I, my average, my grades in these courses are going to really bump my average. Can you reopen my file? What happens is after the fall semester, you can write to us and case by case, we can reassess. Like if if the admission average is a seven and and I'm not saying this is the case for you, but if it's a 5.8 and I don't see a major grade change, I'll say, unfortunately, we can't reassess it. Um, otherwise, if it's close and we see some grade changes, then we'll gladly reopen it. it the, the only caveat is um, Let's say after the fall semester, your grade still isn't to the minimum admission average, but after the winter semester it is. But if the program's full at that point, then unfortunately your file will still remain closed because they've already filled up all their spots. So it really depends on when you would meet that minimum admission average so that we can send it to the committee. Um, some committees do go into June based on precedent, but it doesn't mean that they'll go into June this year. Um, last year, a lot of programs did close a lot sooner um, because they did reach their their numbers, but um, it, it, it depends. So maybe you want to wait to apply to after your fall grades and you could apply in January if the program is still accepting admissions. Maybe you want to consider fall 2023. It all depends on when you get that minimum admission average. But if if at the point of evaluations, there's two things my office will close a file for is if they don't, if they're an international student who doesn't have the minimum language requirements, they'll be closed. Um, or if they don't meet the minimum admission average, um, we can do some reassessments, but we will only reopen the file if they meet the average. Um, and if the program is still accepting applications. OK, Does that um, one. Yeah, just one quick other yeah. thing. Um, do you know if um, an incomplete grade would be counted. I know you said that an F is counted, but I just like an incomplete kind of a gray area. I wasn't sure. Uh, if it's an EIN, which is the code for incomplete here at this institution, then it is equivalent to an F uh, on the U Ottawa grade scale. So if you refer back to the U Ottawa grade scale. And one of the things that I didn't touch upon, but sometimes people are looking at their averages and it's like, okay, I've got. A's everywhere, but I got these two F's from that semester that I wasn't focusing on, and they fall within my 60 credits. It comes back to the repeated course rule that I briefly mentioned about in the calculations. Those would be the courses that you want to focus on retaking, because if you retake those courses in the winter semester, it will eliminate that grade, even if it falls within the last 60 credits, because we only take the most recent grade of a repeated course. We'll not count two courses tw twice. So we just take if you have courses that are dragging down your average and you're looking at repeating a course, if those courses fall on your repeated average, that that's your best bet because sometimes there's something in their most recent 15 credits. So if you're taking new courses, it's going to just eliminate the oldest grades that might have been already A pluses. So it won't change your average. But if you have something in the recent courses that is dragging down your average, repeating that course may be to your advantage. OK, thanks so much. No problem. And uh, now I'm lost. I think Sarah, is that a new hand raise? Uh, yes, it is. I have one more oh, question sure. for you. Um, my question is about admission scholarships for master's programs. I was wondering if your grade, like your admission average, was a 
would you qualify for an admissions average? Or if your grade was, for example, an 8.95, would you qualify for the other level, like for the admission average? Or is it strict that it's an 8.0 and it's a 9.0? I was just wondering what the flexibility was with scholarships. Uh, no flexibility. Uh, no. Flexibility. And I was also wondering, um, do you yeah, the, so one caveat uh, on that, the 8.95, if the future grades do, do bump it up to a nine, um, they we would then uh, recalculate. Um, we recalculated a few 8.8s, 8.9s this year, um, and they moved to the guaranteed scholarships. So that, um, but uh, unfortunately for the 7.9s, because the 8.0, the 8.9s are limited, uh, by the time we would have to do a recalculation, there would be too late. There would be none left, unfortunately. So. Okay, so just to confirm for the 8.9s, um, there is a chance to have the department like recalculate after completing a semester, like a fall semester? Yeah, it wouldn't be the department. It would be uh, us uh, because, oh, okay. um, it, but I mean, theoretically, I think anybody with an 8.9, I'm, depending on when you apply, we'll hopefully be able to get the merit scholarships. So that means you get the same amount of scholarship funding. They're, they all have the $7,500 funding. It's just the 8.0s, 8.9s, there are a limited amount, so not everyone will get them. But um, depending on when you apply, we're hoping someone with an 8.9 would also still get it. It's just the guarantees, and I'm, I don't know how each department's going to allocate them, but I assume someone with an 8.9 will probably be near the top of the list in terms of preference. But I. I, I never know what the departments are going to decide uh, as their priorities. Um, and the TAs for the merit scholarship and the admission scholarships are almost identical. The course and MRP both get two TAs. It's just the thesis instead of getting four TAs, you get three TAs. So um, mm -hmm. there's not much distinction between the packages. It's just the uh, guaranteedness of them. OK, that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. No problem. Uh, Vanessa. Hi, yeah, I was just looking. Um, so I'm a fourth year student that will be graduating um, in this at the end of the semester because I am also in co-op um, and I'm looking to apply for for fall 2022. And I'm wondering if my current grades for the semester will be counted towards my admission average. So uh... If you apply today and you submit all your documents in the next week or so and we upload your transcript, we're going to upload your transcripts that we have today. Um, okay. So we'll take your last 60 credits from this point. So if you meet the admission requirements, or if you're eligible for a scholarship, we're not going to look at your average ever again. Uh, we're not going to go okay. back in winter and say, oh, your average dropped. We're taking back the scholarship. We're not going to do that. Um, we're also not necessarily going to look to see if your average has gone up to see if you're then okay. eligible for the scholarship. Um, so it, it's being strategic about when you apply, if you think yeah. your average is going to go up, if you're not meeting the requirements. Um, in the past, uh, there was an unlimited amount of scholarships a couple years ago, but all, all Ontario universities have been changing their funding packages for the masters. So in the past, it, 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 the time of your applications could have been strategic, um, waiting for your average to change. But now, because of the limited nature of the scholarships, um, it, it's a, it's a bit different. The, the modalities of it. So. And the, but however, the grades for for this fall semester wouldn't necessarily would they all be posted before January fifteenth, for example? Um, I would I would have to look. Not into likely. That I, um, some might get posted in December. Um, so depending okay. on when you apply. Uh, um, I've seen it where we've pulled a transcript and we got half the grades, and okay. sometimes. Sometimes we make an executive decision to wait, but sometimes, um, honestly, my team is incredible. Like they do 2,500 uh, calculations, yeah. but usually in a span of three months. And like some of these calculations could take up to 30 minutes. And sometimes we need a second or third opinion because it's not always straightforward. You auto with transcripts. Uh, I mean, it takes us five minutes to put them together, but sometimes mm -hmm. taking a look out for repeated courses and stuff like that. So at that point, like, we're sometimes just rolling through averages. It's just nonstop yeah. averages. And uh, so if we've got three of your five courses for the fall semesters, so we might just go with that. 
Um, okay. If we know we can just wait two days, we'll just wait two days, but it's not always uh, a luxury at our disposal. Okay, great, thank you. Perfect. Um, I, I've got a Victoria and a Lisa here. Um, Hi. Uh, Hi. I, I, Vic Victoria, if I could just uh, wait two seconds. There was a chat question that my team told me that they wanted me to answer. Um, Cause I just, in case, I, I know some people are leaving and Jen, I can't find that question cause it won't let me get to the chat. Do you want to tell me the question again, Jen? Uh, some uh, two students were asking about uh, possibly uh, deferring uh, admissions. Uh, so just a general rule about deferrals. Um, because we have a, a mandate with WAC, um, they, they manage the applications, they manage the application fees. Uh, if someone who applies for fall 2022, the maximum we can defer is to two sessions, assuming that programs permits uh, winter or spring intakes. Now, none of our programs admit, uh, permit spring intakes, and only a few of our programs uh, permit winter intakes. So if you apply for fall 2022, we're not able to defer you to fall 2023. There are some extreme exceptional cases, um, medical reasons or anything like that. Um, we've had some flexibility with COVID, but I know they are tightening the screws right now. So typically, if the program permits to defer in the winter, we can defer at a limit to the winter semester, but we are not able to defer you to fall 2023, uh, except for extreme exceptional situations. Uh, someone who gets a job in the government and they want to do a year at the government and then start the master's, that's not going to fly. But if there's some medical uh, reasons, then that will be considered. Um, so hopefully that answers the question in the chat. Um, Victoria, sorry about that. It's okay. I was wondering if you're allowed to work during your master's program. I heard that there's some limitations to that. There is a 10 hour a week rule. Um, so that you, we do want to prioritize, um, especially at the research levels, because you're usually paired up with a professor and you're being supervised by a professor. Someone who's working a full time job and trying to manage uh, uh, masters, it does become uh, cumbersome. And um, what we found is it does impact uh, graduation. Um, people will do two, three semesters and then just give up. So you, at that point, a students will pay their, their, their money. Um, they've got nothing out of it. So there are rules in place for the 10 hour rule a week. So usually anybody who's got a teaching assistantship contract, they're, they're usually working approximately 10 hour rule. There are exceptions to the rule. Um, there is a request. There is a lot of students that do work more than 10 hours a week. Um, you just need to submit a request to your supervisor or your program director if you're in a course base and they'll, they'll, they'll have the discussion with you going over those similar points. Um, we understand the realities of the finances at this day and age, um, and especially during COVID. So there is flexibility there to work more than 10 hours a week, um, but it's a department by department decision. The majority do get approved, um, but it's just having that conscious discussion about uh, the impacts that it might have on your master's. Well, thank you for that. Um, I was also wondering during your master's program, um, can you take like, I guess, like FLS courses, even though they're like undergrad levels? Yes, um, so the, the great thing about graduate level is, um, well, it's it's a curse and a, a positive. Um, in the undergrad level, you pay per course. So um, I don't know the how much you pay per course, um, and it depends between international and Canadian students. At the grad level, you get admitted either as a full-time student or a part-time student, and you pay full-time fees. So uh, I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but it's close to $3,000 for the master's for a Canadian student. Um, and yet, whether you take two courses as a full-time student or six courses as a full-time student at the master's level, you just pay that one fixed fee. So if you're taking your three, four courses in criminology or economics and you want to take an FLS course, it doesn't cost you anything more and they just open up spots for you and it, it's the same price. So. Um, a lot of our students do take advantage of those FLS and ESL courses, and there's some courses offered uh, through uh, education just in terms of teaching in the class. So if you're doing a teaching assistantship, there's other courses that uh, give you some uh, great uh, advice in terms of preparing courses or assisting professors and stuff that can be taken and 
it doesn't cost more, although you're you're paying full time fees. So if you're registered as a master's student and as full time and just taking one course, it's to your disadvantage. But if you're following a normal course load, um, taking FLS courses or ESL courses can be to your advantage. And and usually, how much is a normal course load in um, in masters? I know in undergrad, it's usually five, four or five. Yeah, so uh, grad is usually three or four. So the course based uh, programs, um, sometimes we'll see students, especially in economics, uh, you have eight courses to complete your course based program. Uh, Audrey being the downer. Yes, uh, the FLS courses um, can impact if you do have fails and stuff. Um, so um, do take that in mind. Um, what was the question? Uh, courses. So yes, the course base, we sometimes, typically I usually see three courses per semester. Um, I do see in the course based program students wanting to complete after two semesters. So they'll take four in the fall, four in the winter. Um, but mostly our MRP and thesis students um, will take three in the fall, three in the spring, and then usually they'll work in the spring and fall semester on their MRP, their major research paper. So it's about three or four courses. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, perfect. Uh, to my team out there in cyber world, is there any chat questions that I didn't answer? I don't want to go too much over time because I don't know how big this video file is going to be when we try to send it out to you guys later this week. Um, the chat questions should be visible uh, hopefully in the the, uh, the video. Otherwise, we'll tr try to transcribe them. Um, is there any last questions? Anyway, like I said, don't hesitate to email us. Uh, don't hesitate to stop by our office. Uh, we miss the human contact. Uh, we miss the students. It's not the same not having you guys on campus. In the fall, we're hoping everything can hopefully come back to some kind of new normal and have you guys on campus. We're here to help you. Um, I've got a lovely team that's been answering questions in the chats. They're 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 experts at what they do. They're incredible people, and they're there to help you. And whether it's a phone call, whether it's an email, whether it's a Teams chat, a video chat, um, we're there to help you. Whether it's in person, uh, we're here Monday to Friday, nine to five. Our, Nine to four thirty. Uh, uh, and just seeing Victoria's question in the chat that just popped up. Uh, we don't review any documents. Um, uh, it, it's just trying your best to respect the guidelines of the departments. If you're unclear of the intent of what the departments want, um, you can check with the departments of what uh, th they're looking for. Um, but unfortunately, we we with twenty five hundred applications, uh, we unfortunately can't. Uh, provide reviews. We'll let you know if you're not meeting the, the specific uh, format, but later on in February and January, it's it's harder for us to be on top of those files once we're getting such a, such a large influx. So it's important to look at the specific requirements and really meet what they're looking for. But come see us, ask us the, the general questions, and we'll, we'll, we'll assist you to the best of our ability. And um, take care of yourselves. I know uh, COVID seems to be more under control right now, but COVID fatigue is real. You guys are all probably in the second wave of midterms. Take care of yourselves. Good luck with the, the rest of the semester, and uh, hopefully we'll see a bunch of you guys in our master's programs. And if it's not with us, if it's another university, best of luck. Take care of yourselves, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.